members, um, we are ready to go. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, this meeting of the East Cam's District Council. Can I apologise to those members of the public and press who are watching online? We've had a, a technical issue that has meant we couldn't get the live stream working, but we are now broadcasting on the YouTube channel. So many apologies for that. Um, the first item on the agenda we, we have is a very sad one in respect of the death of the former district council and former chairman of this um, council from 1986 to 1988. Um, can I ask um, any members who wish to speak in, in memory of Mike to raise their hands? So I've got Councillor Bailey and then Councillor Every. Thank you, Councillor, oh, and Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, first elected in 1973 for Ely Urban District Council as an independent conservative and still serving on the City of Ely Council up until his death, <coughs> Mike's commitment to our local community uh, is long, obvious and, and enduring. Mike served as mayor to the City of Ely twice and as chairman of this council in the 1980s, he's up on the board there. Uh, as well as serving on multiple committees and chairing many. Always a man with a plan uh, and the ability to tell stories, articulate visions and inspire passion in others. Mike was always able to back up what he was saying with common sense and sound reason reasoning, uh, often with hugely insightful information from history. Always a champion of change and looking forward, Mike was motivated about doing the right thing for the next generation. Mike never let politics get in the way of making the right decision. Mike was first and foremost a representative of the people, even when it might have been at considerable personal cost to himself. And Mike was my partner in crime on free car parking in our town and city centres. Mike was a historian, a confident, an advisor, an inspirer of others, and a friend to this council and a friend of all of us. Universally liked and respected, Mike truly transcended politics as long as it suited him. The hugely well attended celebration of Mike's life at Ely Cathedral is an incredibly moving and fitting tribute. Mike is greatly missed. He leaves a Mike shaped hole in local life, but his mark on Ely and the wider area is enduring. We thank him very much for his long and energetic service to our community. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Every. Thank you, Chair. I had known uh, Mike for over 40 years as a teacher, actor, director, counsellor, historian, photographer and colleague. Mayor of Ely, he brought a humility to the role as first citizen, spending hours of time with our residents supporting their own causes and bringing recognition for them and their organisations. He was on the city council for 50 years and a founder member of the museum. He was our go-to person on anything to do with Ely and was, our, and was a consummate statesman, wise, fair, professional, knowledgeable, but with a wicked sense of humor and so supportive of our local people. As Councillor Bailey has said, his political activity ensured free parking in our city of Ely. He was instrumental in bringing about the Country Park and the Ely Bypass and to, to Ely. He supported our diverse local community and was a community champion to large numbers of citizens. We will never see the like of him again. And the numbers of people at his Thanksgiving was testament to his popularity in standing in the area. He stood as a councillor for Ely and Ely and Miss Cam East Cams will miss him. Thank you, Councillor Every. I've got Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chairman. It's hard to imagine someone more completely Ely than Mike Rouse. Born and educated in Ely, Mike was heavily involved in the life of the city in every way. Not just a councillor on the City of Ely Council, where he served for 50 years, the District Council and the County Council. Mike was also a keen participant in amateur dramatics, a recognised local photographer and chronicler of the local history of our area in a number of books. One of Ely's most recognized figures, he will be greatly missed by all who knew him. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Dupre. I've got Councillor Goldsack. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle and a personal one, if I can. I was unfortunate enough to be uh, ill and unable to attend his service. So these are my thoughts on Mike. I have five real levels of involvement with Mike, and he added value to my life, my development, my upbringing, my public and professional life. Number one was education. From 75 to 80, I was a pupil at Salem Village College, and on many occasions was in the classroom with one Mr. Rouse at the front of it. He was unique, humorous, detailed, and intently funny all the while. Very good man. Private life. I have filled minor roles on stage at Soham College Players and Campaign Amateur Theatre. I never saw a better actor or a better director than Mike Rouse. Professional life. On two occasions, I asked Mike if he would be a reference for me. He never copied me on the references that he wrote. Both times I received a job offer. Public life. I regularly spoke to him regards politics and county and have found no deeper passion for Ely, Soham and East Cambridgeshire than those held by Mike and they are missed already. Family life. When my mother died prematurely uh, 20 years ago, I put together a small set of memoirs, captured anecdotes from what my mum had been involved with. And I wanted to produce them as a gift for, my, for her grandchildren to remember her by. But I wasn't the best at English, even though Mike was my teacher. So I contacted Mike and I said, would you run your eye over him? And he did run his eye over him. And I got them back, red lines all over and corrected spellings all over them. And what I actually said was, love the stories, could do better. You obviously never listened in my lessons. That's, <laughs> and that's always been with me. So I will miss Mike. I'm ever for grateful for the multidimensional relationship I shared with Mike, not at a deep level. And I would just say, rest well, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Col Councillor Goldsack. Is there anybody else wishing to speak? If not, can I ask members to stand in a minute's silence for, to remember Mike? So we move on to the, the agenda. Um, item one is public question time. And I'm aware of one question. Um, so if I can ask um, Graham James, if he could come up to, to and read his question out to the, thank you. Chair and councillors, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, my question is to the leader of the council uh, and relates to the Ely Zipper bus service. I live in Little Thetford and was formerly the chair of the parish council. The service was well used by the residents in Little Thetford before COVID lockdown. After a slow return, it's very apparent that its use now appears to be at least at the same level, if not even higher. Many people that I've spoken to in the village have told me on many occasions how much the service is valued, with more using it now, owing to the price of fuel and concerns over climate change, rather than using their own transport. Little Thetford is extremely grateful for the support it's received from the district and county council in getting the service up and running, alongside the further support during the COVID pandemic. It was with some alarm that I and others in the village heard of an apparent move to stop or significantly curtail the current Ely Zipper service being proposed publicly by the Mayor of the Combined Authority. 
These pronouncements were being made without even considering the potential expansion program to other villages known locally as Zipper 2. I raised these concerns at our parish council meeting last night. The council has written to the mayor of the combined authority, expressing their support to the retention of the Zipper bus service and has received a reply, thanking them for their interest in saying that no decision has yet been made. In his manifesto, the mayor committed to safeguarding and expanding public transport network. Even the idea of curtailing a vital local community service where there is no real alternative is very difficult to understand. As I said, the residents of Little Thetford are extremely grateful for the support already given by the District Council. My question is, can the leader of the District Council specifically and the Council more generally assure us that they are taking all possible steps to preserve the current Zipper service to ensure that the renewal of the contract for the service later this year is prioritised and to support the expansion of the service to Zipper 2. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. James, for that question. Can I ask Councillor Bailey to reply? Yes, and thank you, Mr. James, for, for your question. As you were rightly alluded to, bus services are the responsibility of the Transport Authority, which is the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority under the Mayor, Dr. Nick Johnson. However, this council is fully committed to doing all it can to promote sustainable forms of transport and we undertook a district wide consultation in 2020 via a survey that was sent to every household in the district. This resulted in a great piece of cross party working that produced the bus service proposals for our district, a, a document which was handed over to the, the combined authority. Uh, and we hoped would form part of the new local transport plan as it comes forward. To date, we've had no real response from the combined authority to that piece of work. The Mayor, Dr Nick Johnson, has stated that he wishes to expand bus services, particularly in rural areas like ours. Indeed, he's made it a central and fundamental part of his emerging local transport plan. Most bus services are in fact run commercially with no requirement for state subsidy. However, some services, usually those in rural areas, do require subsidy to make them viable and the Ely Zipper is one such service. The Zipper was championed and developed by Councillor Bill Hunt when he was still a county councillor and launched in 2014. It was in fact a bit of an experiment really to put on a simple, what I would call old fashioned bus service, an hourly service that gets people where, to where they want to go in a reasonably short amount of time, rather than trying to go everywhere and do things for all, all people. Uh, and with flexibility of when they can return because it is hourly. The service has been regularly promoted and nurtured since it began and it's well used and much loved and provides around 22,000 passenger journeys per annum. It's a model we hope to replicate where the geography allows in other areas and is described in the bus service proposals. And prior to COVID, the Ely Zipper was actually the second lowest subsidised service in the whole of Cambridgeshire. The model is that the operator receives a simple payment for running the service and the combined authority keeps the fare box. It's a good model because it ensures that the authority's interest, it's in the authority's interest to get an increasing patronage uh, and to keep promoting the service and increasing the amount of users. There was an opportunity to include a new stop on, on the Ely Zipper route at the Lancaster Way Business Park. Uh, and this means that Grovemere, who run the business park, which in fact is a designated and growing enterprise zone, uh, support the service financially through Section 106 contributions, which were agreed as part of their planning permission to expand the business mm -hmm. park and bring new businesses and high quality <coughs> jobs to the district. The additional funds, in fact, brought the subsidy down even lower and increased usage uh, of the service by paying customers rather than simply by those with a bus pass which are actually funded by the combined authority as well. So many workers now use the service in addition to residents who are accessing education and health healthcare uh, and for shopping and leisure purposes. Even post COVID the Ely Zipper is now back up to 87% uh, of the passenger journeys it had prior to the pandemic and that is growing again uh, and that compares with 75% average for the rest of the county so it shows that it is uh, a very successful and much loved service. All subsidised services are due to be retended soon by the combined authority with new contracts being awarded in October. So Dews, who are a relatively small operator, came to the District Council in early May with concerns that due to the massive hike in fuel prices, they were now running the service at a loss and simply couldn't continue. I thank Jews for coming to us and for giving us an extended period to try to engage with the combined authority to deal with the situation. But Jews had said that if nothing was agreed by the 30th of June, they would very reluctantly have to pull out of the contract early. This would have meant that the Ely Zipper service would have ended in September, 
ridiculously just a few weeks short of when we would, it would be due to start its new contract. Despite huge efforts, efforts by officers and councillors, the combined authority did nothing to deal with this situation, simply referring us to its future retendering process happening later in the year. Clearly, the service ending in September would have left people completely in the lurch uh, and would, who would have had to have turned to alternative means of transport and it would, would have totally undermined service patronage and, I believe, put the future of the service at risk. It, it would be a case of letting the service wither and die, which is the exact opposite of what the mayor says he wants. I certainly wasn't prepared to let this happen. So East Cam's District Council, together with Grovemere, stepped in and agreed to provide the £10,500 support to the zipper until the retendering process has concluded and a new contract let. I've asked the mayor to step up and agree to pay the £10,400 back to East Cam's taxpayers and Grovemere, but had no, no response to that request today. In fact, I've sent another letter um, today because we had a somewhat woolly response. Councillors Bill Hunt and Lisa Stubbs have also been working on an Ely Zipper 2 service, which would service Market Street Ely, The Hive, the Princess of Wales Hospital, Meeple, Sutton, Witcham and Witchford. And we've made specific proposals on this to the CPCA. However, I have to say I'm gravely concerned about the future of all our existing subsidised bus services. Unfortunately, the mayor failed to win any funding from the national £5 billion bus improvement money. Uh, and he's now in the process of developing a framework for the forthcoming retendering of subsidised services. The current proposal of that framework is to rate services based on the cost per passenger journey. Uh, and it's this approach that has in the past taken away rural routes and resulted in increased services in Cambridge City, where people with bus passes can get on frequent and flexible services free of charge and where they complain about not having a service every two minutes. This is at the cost of no services in many of our rural communities, and this is totally unacceptable and, and goes totally against the rhetoric and promises of the mayor. Myself and Councillor Bovingdon, who is, is the council's rep um, on the transport committee, will be speaking against this approach to, to cutting services and instead calling on the mayor to use its own revenue funding to support rural bus services and support the transport needs of East Cam's residents. East Cam's officers are also working to the same aim. Uh, and in fact, I think it would be helpful if we asked uh, tonight the chief executive to write to the CPCA as well on this subject, just to underline its importance. So, uh, Mr. James, the answer is yes, we will do absolutely everything we can within our limited powers uh, to assure this service continues. But the Ely Zipper is far from assured. And I do urge all users of the Zipper and all parish councils and community groups to write to the mayor and demand that he commits to a long term future for the Ely Zipper service. And we will We'll also continue to work towards improved bus services for our whole area, uh, including pushing for Ely Zipper 2. Thank you for bringing this to, to the Council's attention. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Bailey. Okay, thank you for your question, Mr. James, um, and your attendance this evening. Um, next, were, were there any more public questions in the box, um, Tracy? No. Okay, in which case we move on to item two, which is apologies for absence. Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from councillors Kane, Edwards, Huffer, Starkey, Stubbs, Alison Whelan, and Christine Whelan. <clears throat> Councillor Dupre. And also Councillor John Trapp and Councillor Matt Dunn. Did you get those two? Um, Tracy, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dupre. Uh, item three is declarations of interest um, to receive declarations from members for any item on the agenda in accordance with the members' code of conduct. Is there any? I'm seeing no declarations. So moving on then to item four, which is the minutes from the last meeting held on the 19th of May to confirm as a correct record. Do I have any um, corrections to those minutes? Again, I'm seeing nothing, so I, must, I will take that as assent to those minutes. Thank you. I, item Moving on then to item five is Chairman's announcements. Um, I have one announcement. I just would like to take a moment to congratulate and thank Lynn Smart for 25 years service. Um, Lynn is sat at the back, but I don't want to embarrass her. Um, she didn't want too much fuss but we couldn't let it go unmarked, could we? 
Lynn joined the council in May 1997 as a typist work processor, word processor operator. She was promoted to typing word processing services team leader in February 2001. And then to PA to the deputy chief executive and executive director HR and IT in August 2001. Lynn was promoted to the role of PA to Chief Executive and the Chairman of Council in June 2010. So that's 12 years ago. So that's, you know. And for all of those years, Lynn has always been professional, friendly, and approachable and takes everything in her stride. And I, I, I can only thank her from my point of view in the last, just over the last year, for the help that she's given me in my role as chairman. And I know that I'm sure chairman before me um, who are here tonight or, or not or watching on will also value how well they've the support they've received from Lynn. So just like to thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you, Lynn. Move on to item six, which is to receive petitions. And I understand there aren't any. So I then move on to item seven, which is notice of motions under procedure rule 10. And we have um, one motion, which is in respect of climate change. So can I ask um, Councillor Dupre to, as the proposer of that motion to introduce the motion? Thank and you. sorry, just to say, uh, uh, I presume Councillor Inskip is the second, or are you reserving your right to speak? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. This motion asks East Cambridgeshire District Council to join the 193 other local authorities who, along with MPs, peers, and others, have formally given their support to the Nature and Climate Declaration and the Climate and Ecology Bill. Climate change and biodiversity loss are the most significant issues of our time, and the risks of delayed action are well recognised and severe. The Cross-Party Nature and Climate Declaration was launched in Parliament in May 2022. It calls on the UK government to deal with those risks by firstly fulfilling the UK's fair share of emissions reductions, to ensure that the average global temperature increase will not exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius. Secondly, halting and reversing biodiversity decline by 2030. And thirdly, delivering a more ambitious and integrated environmental protection and decarbonisation plan. The Climate and Ecology Bill was written by scientists, experts and campaigners, and first introduced in Parliament in September 2020. It now has the backing of over 150 parliamentarians representing all major political parties. The bill is a plan to address the full extent of the climate change and nature crisis by placing a duty on the Secretary of State to achieve both a climate and a nature target. It also requires the creation of an emergency night climate and nature strategy and an independent representative climate and nature assembly to consider expert advice and recommend measures for inclusion in the strategy. The bill would impose duties on the Committee on Climate Change and the Joint Nature Conservation Committee to evaluate, monitor and report annually on the implementation of the strategy and the achievement of interim targets, including recommending annual carbon budgets for the UK. Like many others, this council has declared a climate emergency and agreed a series of actions to reduce its carbon footprint. But ambition and willingness on the part of local government aren't matched by capacity, with barriers in place preventing action being taken. According to UK 100, the network of the most ambitious local authorities working to address climate change, these barriers include national policy mechanisms which actively work against local authorities making effective use of their potential to cut emissions, government not providing the investment required, lack of clarity from Westminster over the role of local authorities, a lack of capacity with job cuts to key areas of sustainability, 
a shortage of funding made worse by the demands of COVID at a local level, and old ways of doing things which don't consider the need to decarbonize. The declaration and the bill seek to move the government towards that clear climate leadership. Together they are powerful measures, and this motion calls on this council to publicly endorse them. Thank you, Councillor Dupre. Do I have any speakers? Councillor Bailey. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's my understanding that this bill has been developed by campaign members of Extinction Rebellion, Big Ask and Power for the People. Tackling climate change is, of course, critically important and the UK is doing its bit. The UK was the first G7 country to legislate for net zero by 2050. This council is committed to doing so by 2040, and we continually work towards trying to improve on that date. But I believe aiming for net zero nationally by 2030 is almost certainly impossible, and I think it could seriously undermine buy-in from the public and uh, undermine consensus building. Government has committed to the most ambitious interim target of all the major economies in the world, and that's to reduce emissions by 68% from 1990 levels by 2030. Government's also committed to supporting poorer countries with protection of biodiversity, rich land and ocean, and moving to sustainable food production and supply. And government has made commitments and taken action on fossil fuels and is doing well in domestic energy supply and moving the country to renewables. I personally don't believe that citizens' assemblies on their own have advantages over more conventional policy making. And I understand that in Canada, in fact, the decision of citizens' assemblies have failed to produce lasting or impactful change. Of course, really, Chairman, what actually matters in all of this is deeds, not words. What matters is every decision of every human being on the planet every single day. So what we do here in East Cams matters, and we are committed in delivering on this agenda. But Chairman, I do find it, and I can't help myself but bring this up, I, I find it incredibly disingenuous of the Liberal Democrat group on the one hand to lecture about supporting the bill, which calls for halting and reversing UK biodiversity loss by 2030, whilst on the other, continuing to campaign and argue for an outdoor centre at Meeple with activities that the Wildlife Trust themselves have told us are totally incompatible with the flourishing biodiversity on that site, including nationally important species. They do this purely for political reasons. Where is their moral stance on protecting and enhancing what is a nationally important site for biodiversity? Imagine, Chairman, just for a second, if we actually put proposals to this council to destroy a nationally important protected wildlife site, and yet the Lib Dems continue to argue for exactly that. The hypocrisy, Chairman, isn't lost on me. When push comes to shove, the Lib Dems put their own political interests before protection of the environment. I believe the UK is leading from the front on this agenda. The results are tangible. And whilst there's still a huge amount more to do, government is focused, working internationally on this problem. And most importantly, it is delivering. So whilst it's always helpful to raise awareness of these issues uh, and all of the problems arising from climate change, we do not consider this bill to be necessary when the government has a plan and is delivering and we won't be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Dupre. I've got Councillor Josh Schumann. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as somebody who was uh, chairing a committee at Cambridgeshire County Council for a number of years, um, which saw huge environmental improvements in Cambridgeshire, I'm really proud of what we did, and I'm certainly somebody who believes it's an important issue. However, there's three reasons why I couldn't support this motion tonight and or the bill as it stands, and I'll be brief. But firstly, the Citizens' Assembly, which Councillor Dupre mentioned in her introduction, uh, would require the Secretary of State to make decisions based on the Citizens' Assembly's advice. This would circumnavigate the parliamentary process. And if we uh, enable these kind of decisions to be taken behind closed doors, it means that rather than having greater public scrutiny, we end up with fewer people making decisions for us. Two, the re-wetting of the fens it appears within this bill very clearly rec with recommendations that this would be a way to tackle climate change. I'm not sure our residents of East Cambridgeshire would thank us for supporting a bill which suggests that re-wetting the fens was a, a credible solution when we know publicly this has been met with a great resistance, particularly around the areas of Sutton and Erith, which we know are very already very low-lying and would suffer uh, you know, complete change overnight if this were to happen. 
And thirdly, and I think probably most importantly, this bill makes no secret of the fact that it would look to increase uh, energy bills in households where they'd be reliant on gas heating. We know there's a huge, uh, a huge mission to change our reliance on gas for heating homes. However, we also know that energy bills at the minute are creating huge worries and concerns for a number of residents throughout East Cambridgeshire in this country. There's no way I could support a bill which makes a clear pledge to increase bills further and put further stress on those residents. So for those reasons, we can't support the bill tonight, but I certainly wouldn't want the message going that I know nobody within our group would not want to support anything which increased biodiversity and help support our carbon, uh, carbon zero uh, ambitions. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor, thank, thank you, Councillor Schumann. I've got Councillor Hunt now. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think like most people, and certainly people in my group, uh, I applaud the sentiment behind the bill. I mean, anything that improves the situation has to be good. However, I cannot support a motion that gives support to Extinction Rebellion. It's, an it's, a, it's a group that promotes illegal behaviour and I personally have, have no time for it. it. Getting climate change is, or making climate change is a very important thing to do. Uh, and I, I think it's something we should all be concentrating on. However, I believe that a slavish adhesion to a bill is not the way to go forward. The way forward is, as actually Councillor Bailey said, deeds, not words. And just a few things. The central government is spending three billion pounds over the next five years. And that's gonna happen whether or not this bill becomes fact or not. And we, in this, this council, are clearly doing what we can. And we recognize the need for climate change and, and we're, we're acting on it. We're, we're introducing 24 charging points at three sites around the district. We've, we've instigated a Create an Orchard program. We're allocating 1.75 million to existing housing stock to make eco, um, climate change improvements. We're putting solar panels uh, on our buildings at East Base North. And, and we're, we're working with um, our, our waste disposal vehicles to see if we can use a low carbon fuel. We will continue working to make the climate better and to achieve the goals that everybody wants. But I think supporting this, um, this proposal is something I just couldn't do and will not support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. I've got Councillor Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, following on from the previous speakers, I too have some grave concerns about the, uh, the detail in the bill. But let's be quite clear, uh, everybody in this council is very clear that we do need to take action on both climate change and nature. And that's why in our corporate, our following agenda item on the uh, corporate plan, says we will be providing support and assistance to parishes and local communities in developing and implementing local climate change and nature action plans. And I know certainly speaking for, for Burwell, Burwell Parish Council has been very active in that already and is providing a lead to others. But there is some real, I have some real difficulties with some of the detail in the bill. Councillor Dupre mentioned the Climate Change Committee setting carbon budget for the UK. But actually what the bill says is it will set carbon budgets for the United Kingdom, for Scotland, for Wales, and for Northern Ireland. Now, maybe it's my being a, a bearer of little brain, but that to me is trying to drive something in the union of the United Kingdom. And I can't support it on that grounds. Also, we are being asked to support something that will give financial support and training for those in other countries affected by the actions. What does that mean? I can't support that. I don't understand what it means. Thank you, Chairman. I can't support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I'm seeing no other people wishing to speak. Oh, Councillor Harris. 
Yes, I was. I wasn't going to because I'm not feeling at my best. But there were one or two things in um, some of the responses that I just made note of and just just wanted to bring forward again. So, um, in no particular order, we heard that climate change is the responsibility of every one of us. Actually, climate change is the responsibility of large enterprises first. We as in individuals have to live in the context created by large enterprises. So every time somebody says it's all down to us, they're actually missing the point. It's down to a regime in which there is no more drilling for oil, no more coal mines, and in, in which clean air and pedestrianization, for example, are top priorities. Second point is this business about um, citizens groups. Now, one of the things that, that I heard was that decisions would be taken behind closed doors. My understanding, certainly based on the very successful citizens assemblies carried out in the Republic of Ireland about 10 years ago, is that on the contrary, uh, key points are brought right out into the open and, are, and have to be presented to legislators for them to discuss. Nobody makes decisions behind closed doors, they have discussions. And it's particularly interesting that you should choose a day like this to say it. Yesterday, we heard that the Australian trade bill, which has been criticized by normally safely conservative voting farmers as environmentally very, very destructive, will not receive any time for scrutiny in parliament at all. So the abs in the end, it is necessary to get your ducks in a row. If you are going to move ahead with something without scrutiny, it, it's not that sensible to accuse a system like this, citizens' assemblies, as being without scrutiny. Final other points, if you have citizens' assemblies, which are of their nature, both national and local, then this business about the, 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 the fens being destroyed by centrally made um, decisions, that is exactly what we want to avoid. We have always been very much about putting as much decision-making power in the hands of local people as we can, so that nobody takes a decision in Whitehall that says, by the way, this is going to happen. And, and we know about water stress in Cambridgeshire. You cannot move for stories about water stress caused by developments. That is actually our major problem. And, and it's one I think we're all very much aware of. And my last, absolutely last two points, Extinction Rebellion are an absolute pain. But I remember when we had the Black Lives Matter bill, the sticking point for the conservative group was Black Lives Matter. Now I'm hearing that the sticking point for this is Extinction Rebellion. It may be that in 20 years time, our children see them as heroes and us as, as villains. So I really do feel that one should just take this suggestion in the spirit in which it was offered, because it is a kind of experiment. If we put forward something in an ecumenical spirit that says, can we look at this? Can we discuss it? Can we change the wording? Can we amend it? Are there things that are you don't like? Oh, uh, well, okay. No, I'm, I'm making a fool of myself. It's all right, Josh. I know the bill is the bill, and you either support that or you don't. Good spot. But I was hoping that we might have a little bit of give and take, an open discussion here, and not quite so much, it's the Lib Dems being hypocrites. Every single one of us in our different ways from time to time is a hypocrite. It's the human condition, I think. But now and again, maybe bite your tongue when you say that and say, well, shall we talk about this before we actually just pass it back over the uh, over the net. And that's it. Done. Thank you, Councillor um, Harris. I've got a point of order, if I order. may, Chair. Just a point of personal explanation. I think Councillor Harris probably did realise as his speech continued, my comment wasn't that the Citizen Assembly would make the decision to rewet the fens. 
but actually specifically the bill calls for re-wetting of Fenland. So if you support the bill today, that's what you're supporting. It specifically mentions the re-wetting of peatland, and I quote. So it wasn't the assembly, it's just for your clarity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Schumann. I'm seeing no other, no other speakers, in which case I move to Councillor Inskip as the seconder of the motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I'm assuming uh, Councillor Schumann doesn't, uh, doesn't support Wickham Fen and the, and the great work that's, that's been done there. I think there are, there are certainly uh, some, some, some really good uh, uh, measures being taken there, exploring what we can do uh, around biodiversity. But, and I think it's disappointing overall that the Conservative councillors have chosen to, to misrepresent the bill that's, um, that's supported by more than 400 different organisations, uh, a large number of scientists, as well as those politicians that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Councillor Dupre mentioned earlier. Unlike, unlike Councillor Harris, I was hoping for a little bit more, for a more mature debate because you know, this is, this is a really serious subject. The latest scientific evidence is clear. We're now in a decisive decade for tackling climate change and the, the global ecological decline. We look at the most recent IPC working uh, party report, the sixth assessment report, it's unequivocal. Unless we make immediate, rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gases, limiting global warming to safe levels will become beyond reach. And at the same time, we're seeing a, a decline of wildlife species that is fast accelerating, uh, and where human activity is causing and will are predicted to cause a, a major wildlife extinction, probably that one of the largest extinctions in our, our planet's history. And the decisions that policy and lawmakers take on this, the most significant issue of our time are going to determine the legacy that we leave for both present and for future generations over coming decades and beyond. Um, it's, it's up to us, we can make the decision to try to conserve a you know, stable and prosperous life with a rich and natural world within the UK and beyond. It's not just a problem that ends at the borders. We can do that or we can through limited or delayed action we can choose to expose present and future generations to high levels of risk around physical, social and, uh, and financial risk, leaving an inheritance for our children and grandchildren of, of a wide scale uh, instability and an impoverished natural world. Now, it was only uh, two years ago in October 2019 that we had a rather heated debate, but in the end, this Council as a whole declared a climate emergency and committed to the development of an annual environment plan. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you look at the latest edition of that plan, that makes very stark the, the challenges that we have. To quote from that plan, it says, if temperature increases at the current rate, warming is likely to reach one and a half degrees uh, between 2030 and 2052, leading to regional scale changes to climate including dramatic increases in the frequency and intensity of flood or drought events across the world, including the UK. And we're already starting to see some of the early signs of that. Those risks are set to increase should warming reach two degrees. And the longer that temperatures remain high, the harder it becomes to reverse that damage. The Climate and Ecology Bill that we're looking for this council to support is the only legislation that's before the UK Parliament that will effectively tackle climate and the natural, natural emergency that we're facing in line with that current evidence. And that's why scientists who specialize in those areas have, have supported and, and helped create that bill. The bill creates a core climate and natural targets that are rooted in scientific evidence and that are essential to address that climate and ecology emergency. The bill is looking to reduce the UK's greenhouse gases at emissions consistent with limiting uh, global mean temperature increase to the one and a half degrees. That one and a half degrees that we highlight is so important in our own environment plan. And it takes account of our international commitments under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Convention. And it also requires the UK to halt and reverse 
the UK's overall contribution to the degradation and lo loss of nature in the UK and overseas and consistent with the international commitments under the UK Convention on, on Biodiversity. And I have to say, Councillor Bailey, I'm not convinced that many residents would see the building of an unwanted industrial scale uh, crematorium as a major contributor to increasing biodiversity in our district. I think we can do much better than that. This bill is a measured bill. It looks at having a positive and fair impact on our local communities. It recognises that we need financial support, that people need retraining to transition to from uh, working in high emissions and high impact industries to new opportunities and a low carbon economy. Already, as we've heard, 120 MPs, 31 peers, 193 councils have publicly expressed support for this bill. And those... tackling the climate emergency. Thank you, Councillor Inskip. Um, can I call upon Councillor Dupre's the proposal of the motion to sum up, please? Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. And I will start by saying that I share Councillor Inskip's disappointment that we haven't seen from members opposite a more mature debate on this uh, motion this evening. However, I do get one point for the first disingenuous of the evening from Councillor Bailey, so there's always that. Uh, we've seen more straw men this evening than a scarecrow festival. Uh, and I'm not going to dignify all of them with a response because some of them are just so absurd. However, I will return to just two of those. Firstly, the rewetting of the fens. As Councillor Inskip says, there are some superb examples of what's going on around the fenlands uh, in, of Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire and elsewhere in terms of addressing peat and the, the dangers of, of excessive uh, emissions from, from peat. And uh, rewetting of the fence doesn't mean I'm going to be boating from Sutton to Ely to trade my apples for eels. I mean, you know, get real, get real. It's nothing like that at all, and the opposition knows it. Secondly, energy bills. The entire point is that we are being held to massive fuel increases due to our dependence on fossil fuels. We're seeing that every day with gas, with oil and with uh, energy, uh, electricity derived from fossil fuels, people are facing extortionate bills. And much of that in terms of heating their home is not actually down to the prices of the, uh, the, the, the fuels, it's down to the insulation. And there are significant areas of this district where there are homes that are absolutely leaking energy at every turn. And the way of addressing that is retrofitting those homes. And to reach that point, you have to retrofit currently, if you're going to hit net zero by 2050, one million homes a year. And the entire point of this motion, the entire point of the bill, of the declaration, is that the government is getting nowhere near ready for the scale of the enterprise that we face. And the exact point, as in, in Councillor Schumann's own division of, of running a scheme like Swatham Prior, um, the entire point is to protect people from those huge variations and fluctuations in the price of fossil fuels and to provide them with a green alternative. And yes, uh, oh, Citizens' Assembly, that was the other one, the great danger that gathering people together and asking for their views would lead to Parliament and, the, and the, the responsibility of Parliament to make decisions being usurped from a party that has for the last six years done exactly that and taken a, 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 a advisory referendum as if it was the word of God. 
This is all about actions, not words. This is absolutely all about actions, not words. And it is about the inability of local authorities to take the actions they want to take because of the lack of action in sufficient volume from national government. That is the whole point. I have to say, finally, that we have been assured from members opposite tonight that they didn't choose to amend the bill, the, the, the motion. They didn't choose to refer the, the motion to a committee. They chose to oppose the motion. They would never, never support anything that we on this side proposed. We have seen that. That is their number one rule. We never agree with a Liberal Democrat motion on anything, even if you agree with it. But the choice to oppose, we're told, is because they really, really care about the environment and net zero. I would remind them respectfully in closing that net zero and the aspiration to tackle climate and carbon emissions has never been under more threat in this country than it is at the moment as leaders in waiting of the Conservative Party nationally parade themselves around as being the least environmentally friendly of all. At least two of the uh, intended leaders of the Conservative Party are currently boasting that they would scrap all the net zero rubbish. And that is something that I frankly dread that we will see the Conservative Party mm -hmm. leadership race to the bottom descend into the election as prime minister of this country of someone who will undo all the work, all the commitments, everything that's going on and all the investment that should be being uh, put in place to tackle this very real challenge. That is my greatest fear that we will have as a leader of this country, someone who doesn't care and the failure of members opposite to support the, the bill the declaration demonstrates that the party opposite is on a very dangerous, very dangerous slope, not just for themselves, but for the planet. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thank you, Councillor Dupre. So we move to the vote. Chair, sorry, uh, point of order. Could we have a recorded vote, please? Yeah. <laughs> No, there's no requirement for numbers. No, no. I think. When I call your name, can you say whether you're voting for, against, or abstaining on the motion? Councillor Christine Ambrose Smith. Against. Councillor David Ambrose Smith. Against. Councillor Sue Austin. Abstain. Councillor Anna Bailey. Against. Councillor Ian Bovingdon. Against. Councillor David Brown. Against. Councillor Lorna Dupre. For. Councillor Liz Every. Against. Councillor Mark Goldsack. Against. Councillor Simon Harries. For. Councillor Bill Hunt. Against. Councillor Mark Inskip. For. Councillor Alec Jones. For. Councillor Daniel Schumann. Against. Councillor Joshua Schumann. Against. Councillor Alan Sharp. Against. Councillor Paula Trimarco. For. Councillor Joe Webber. Against. Councillor Gareth Wilson. For. So the motion is lost by six votes to 12 with one abstention. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, I move on now to item eight, which is to answer questions from members. Um, and we've got five questions this evening. So if I could ask for the benefit of members of the public and press watching at home, if I could ask um, the members to read the question. The first one I've got is a question from Councillor Inskip to the Leader of the Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the, the end of this month will be the second anniversary of the extraordinary full Council meeting, which revealed the Council's administration had been working on a secret project to build a crematorium. As we subsequently learned, uh, the plan 
is to build a crematorium on the site of the much loved Meeple Outdoor Centre. The council's records show that the first payments towards the crematorium project were made in January 2019. There have been further expenditure in each subsequent year. Can the leader of the council confirm the expenditure made in each of the financial years 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020, 2020, 2021, 2022, 20, 2021, 2022, and the current financial year to date on the, on the crematorium project? And can the leader of the council further confirm the increase in the estimated development cost from 6.54 million pounds as a consequence of the delays to the project gaining planning approval. Thank you, Councillor Inskip. Can I ask Councillor Bailey to respond? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so um, the expenditure in each of the financial years 2018-19 was 29,105. 2019-20, it was 64,451 pounds 28. In 2021, it was 218, 935.75, 21-22, 63, 865.19, and the current financial year, 2,629 pounds. So in line with full council approval in July, 2020, a detailed planning application has been developed and submitted. The time frame it has taken to develop the planning application has reflected the extended consultation that was required with statutory consultees uh, and then awaiting their formal responses, a very considerable time frame in some cases. Uh, specifically, engagement with the Highways Authority at the County Council has taken a uh, very considerable time because of the requirements of the Highway Authority, frankly, changing uh, when there was a change in staff at the County Council uh, dealing with the consideration of the planning application. However, uh, through persistence on the part of the project team, all, all highways matters have now been resolved, but that took uh, a huge extended period, uh, thanks to the County Council. Um, this is a very significant project. Uh, it's right to be thorough and to present it when it is uh, in a position to present to Council. And subject to planning approval being secured for the project, the further review of the funding strategy uh, will be undertaken after an update of the capital costs for the project. This was agreed to be reported back to members before final approval, so it will be a final business case um, before final approval to progress with the scheme or not. Uh, and finally, I, I would just remind members what I said during the last item that I again find it incredibly disingenuous of the Liberal Democrat group to keep bemoaning the loss of the previous use of the site, which ended in 2017, in which we tried incredibly hard uh, through cross party working at the time to bring forward uh, a similar use for the site and it was not found to be financially viable or possible uh, as some members or one member opposite knows perfectly well uh, and their constant arguing against our second effort uh, at finding a viable use for this site without putting forward any alternative viable proposal uh, and they made no objection to the demolition of the structures on the site of the former Meeple Outdoor Centre which frankly were dangerous uh, and a risk to public health uh, none whatsoever, no objection to that. Um, some use of this site has to be found and the site we now know has to be protected for its biodiversity assets. So continuing to argue and taking to social media to bemoan the loss of the outdoor centre and saying it should still be an outdoor centre, uh, you know, it is utterly dis disingenuous. And if they're still confused about it, perhaps the Lib Dem group should seek advice from their deputy leader as it is the organisation that Councillor Kane in fact, is the deputy chief executive of the local wildlife trust that is giving that very advice to this council that curtails what the site can and can't be used for in terms of outdoor activity. Uh, and for good reason to protect the biodiversity of the site and uh, improve the, the ecology as we were talking about in the last item on this agenda and as the members opposites so passionately declare that they care about. Uh, I have a little suspicion, Chairman, that it doesn't suit them politically to take note of their deputy leader organisation's advice to this council. Because Chair, they're far more order, Chair. Council, Council Chair, I, I don't believe the second part of my, uh, my question was answered. And, and now Councillor Bailey seems to be making a speech on the, on, the, on the crematorium rather than telling us what the estimated increase in the development cost was, which was the second part of my question. Thank you. Um, I, I believe she, she's met, referred to the business case coming to council at a later stage, so presumably that's when the money, but if we can 
I, d I did indeed, there, Chairman. I did answer. I do believe that I uh, did the very best I could on answering that part of the question uh, because that cost is as yet unknown. The business case will come forward to this council, which has always been, been the promise. Uh, well, well, Chair, in that case, couldn't Councillor Bailey just say that the cost has increased? We don't know by how much yet. And that's the end of the answer to the question. Uh, now, I'm not in a position to say that the cost has increased because we haven't got, we, we, we haven't established the bill cost, the current bill cost. So I'm not in a position to confirm that. No, what I have confirmed is the expenditure as requested over the last years, which is uh, a known amount of money. Um, and, and I will end by saying uh, that, you know, that the, the, the members opposite should listen to the advice of the deputy leader that, that has her organisation that has provided statutory advice to this council. But I'm afraid, Chairman, they seem to be far more interested in political point scoring than actually caring about this ecologically, nationally important site and its future protection. It's about deeds, not words, Chairman. OK, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, the second question I've got is from Councillor Harris, again to Councillor Bailey. Councillor Harris. Might be worth saying at the start that this is not a trick question. And it is absolutely not a party political question. Over the past 18 months, planning applicants in some parts of East Cambridgeshire have not received any response from Network Rail, even for very urgent concerns that relate directly to planning applications. Repeated attempts to ask for a substantive reply on such matters have been blocked month after month. In one case, an application has been held up for a full 18 months as a result. Will the leader of the council take steps to find out from Network Rail, the highest level she can reach, why such delays are taking place and what can be done to remove them? Thank you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Bailey. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Councillor Harris. Um, I've spoken to officers about this. They're not aware of um, any particular specific applications where the lack of response from Network Rail is being the sole reason for preventing a decision on a planning application. Uh, it would be, I'd welcome Councillor Harris sharing more information with me so that uh, I can ask officers to investigate further. And of course, absolutely, if there are issues, we, we will write to Network Rail and find out what's causing any delay. Councillor Harris. I had a very, very brief uh, call yeah, with I'm just... um, Sally earlier today. And I think I'll follow up on that, giving chapter and verse if that's all right. And then yeah. you can decide. Yeah, we can take that outside the meeting and I'm sure if you can give the details to officers and Councillor Bailey, then that can be taken up. Thank you. Um, then the third question is from Councillor Dupre to, to the leader of the council. The council ma planning manager's post was advertised some weeks ago. There are rumours, though no written announcement to councillors of other departures in the council's planning team. Will the leader of the council make a statement about capacity in the council's planning service, including current and forthcoming vacancies, the success or otherwise of attempts to fill those posts, and her assessment of the capacity of the council to provide an effective planning service? Thank you, Councillor Dupre. Um, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, thank you for your question, Councillor Dupre. So, um, yeah, recently the planning manager and one team leader have left the council and a team leader is due to leave the council in August. We filled the team leader positions, uh, which included an additional post at team leader level. And I'm very pleased to say that these positions were filled through internal promotions. This was announced during the chairman's announcements at last week's planning committee. Uh, we'll soon be advertising for the vacancies that have arisen as a result of the, those internal promotions. With the planning manager post, the first round of recruitment has been unsuccessful. So we've undertaken a salary benchmarking exercise and it is now being re-advertised uh, the position with a, a market supplement. We've also secured agency support while we recruit to vacant posts. So the service is properly resourced. Uh, and I'm confident that this council will continue to provide an effective planning service and, and one that, uh, of which I am extremely proud. It, it, it is a service nationwide that is under a lot of pressure and um, but, but they uh, continue to do an excellent job. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. The next question I've got is from Councillor Jones to the chair of the Operational Services Committee. As um, Councillor Huffer is not here, Councillor, the vice chair of that committee is going to answer the question. 
Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so um, basically, given disruptions to the uh, to the waste over the last few months and the changes that have happened in service, uh, we just want to think give us an update on how recycling rates have been affected. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Ambrose Smith. Thank you, Councillor Jones, for this, uh, this your question. ECSS has sought to mitigate the impact of service inter disruption on the amount of recycled material. ECSS did not propose changes to the frequency of collections as part of the reconfiguration re of the rounds. Residents experience mis experiencing missed collections were advised to leave their bins out for collection and those who contacted customer services stating they had no additional capacity, those bins were issued, those bins were issued with clear and brown sacks. And to answer your question, we are currently unable to quantify the success or otherwise of these mitigation measures, as we do not currently have recycling figures for the first quarter for comparative purposes. We will provide all members with this data when it becomes available. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Councillor Ambrose Smith. Sorry. The, the final question is from Councillor Wilson, again to the Chair of the Operational Services Committee, and again the Vice Chairman will, will answer that question. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> what is the additional cost to date incurred by ESCAM's uh, uh, street services for making the various changes necessary to ensure the waste collection service meets the agreed service levels. Uh, what are the additional projected costs of these changes for the full financial year? And does ECSS plan to pass these costs onto the council through an increased management fee for the same agreed service level? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor David Ambrose Smith. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, it's rather a long answer, and I hope you don't mind me going going through all the salient points are in there so i'll go through it as it's stated here there are two broad areas of additional expenditure planned for 2022-23 related to the use of agency staff to cover staff absences and issues arising from round reconfiguration and the implementation of the improvement action plan it is very difficult to split the cost between covering staff absences and additional resources to cover missed bins Nevertheless, uh, as an indication, staffing costs for the first quarter, that's in-house staff plus agency costs, are over budget by 17,500 pounds. Uh, in terms of the improvement action plan, there are three additional cost entries uh, centers spe specifically. Additional support from external contractors, currently country countryside recycling, and that cost incurred to date is uh, 10,800 pounds. Additional consultancy support to ECSS management subject to contract. Uh, short term and long term review of staff terms and conditions and working arrangements subject to consultation. Current costs relate to temporary enhancements to overtime arrangements and the payment of an additional 6% on basic salary for ES, ECSS non manageable staff. The long term permanent review will be subject to consultation. ECSS is committed to commit completing the improvement action plan by the end of October 2022, and will provide members with a financial update at that time. That will be, reflect the outcome of the consultation and any contractual changes. The impact of the council's management fee will initially be a matter for the ECSS board prior to consideration by the council. This will reflect an assessment of the overall increased costs and the extent to which some of these may be of a recurring nature. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ambrose Smith. I move now on to item nine, which is the corporate plan. And if I can ask um, the Chief Executive to introduce the paper, please. Thank you, Chairman. I will keep it brief. The appendix to the report is the proposed updated corporate plan and the report itself summarises priorities for 22-23 and takes a look back at progress over the last 12 months and the recommendations are in paragraph 2.1. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, John. 
Um, can I ask for a proposal of the recommendations, Councillor Bailey? Do, do you wish to? And a seconder. Happy to second, Chair, and reserve my right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schumann. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we work incredibly hard to deliver the promises we make at election time when we set out clearly what people can expect from us if they vote us in as the administration. We've delivered our promise to keep council tax low. We've frozen council tax for nine years in a row, the only district council in the country to have achieved this. And I thank the Liberal Democrat and independent members for their recognition at this year's budget meeting that freezing council tax was the right decision. I hope I can look forward to that continued support next February if we're able to do it then. Despite it not being within the remit of this council, we are championing alternative travel. We've delivered our bus service proposals and our cycling and walking strategy to the combined authority. And you heard earlier how the council has stepped in to support the Ely Zipper bus service through to the point of retendering. We will continue to fight the case for bus service improvements at the CPCA for East Cam's residents. We've commissioned and received the five feasibility studies for new cycle routes from Sustrans and we'll champion improvements and work to deliver further feasibility studies. And whilst we promote and encourage train and bus use and active travel, we also recognise that many people still need to drive. We continue to provide free car parking in our town and city centre car parks, and we oppose the introduction of congestion charging in Cambridge, and we continue to push for necessary road schemes in our district. And we look forward to hearing from the police at our full council meeting in October about the rollout of their on-street parking enforcement pilot, and I understand trials of the new technology have been very successful. I was delighted to be asked to speak recently at a National Homes England event uh, about the council's work to support community-led development. It's the second national event where East Cams was being held up as a national example of how to build a supportive policy environment to help community-led development flourish. I'm more committed than ever to continue support for our CLTs and I thank the efforts of CLT trustees who give their time, energy and expertise and I applaud and support their efforts. I was also incredibly gratified to speak with an owner of one of the new 100k homes in Ely recently, a hardworking young person delighted to be buying their first home. It was right for the District Council to take over this policy and deliver the 100k homes that local people have been promised by the combined authority, a policy abandoned by Mayor Dr Nick Johnson as soon as he came into office. We will continue to deliver more 100k homes in Ely and in Kennet, and we will promote and encourage first homes to be delivered on new sites in the future. We're undertaking a thorough review of the waste service to ensure that recent problems do not reoccur and I once again reiterate our apologies to residents for the disruption to their service. We are committed to high levels of recycling and to continue uh, being in the top 20 in the country and the best in Cambridgeshire and we look forward to the implementation of the, the National Waste and Resources Strategy as well. Uh, we continue to deliver our Environment Action Plan. We've got 20 new pledges this year, and I'm very proud of the progress we're making. Pledges this year include installing 24 electric vehicle charging points in East Cam's car parks, a return to the successful Community Orchard Programme, and working with the East Cam's Partnership Forum to set up a new climate cafe for engagement and ideas. We continue the commitment to home energy improvements with £1.75 million identified for exactly this purpose. It's great to see the SIL money being put to such good use across the district. The council's helping to deliver new health and community facilities to support our growing area. And we'll continue to support NHS colleagues with the redevelopment at the Princess of Wales Hospital and very much hope to commit SIL funds to help make this happen. We continue to work on the proposals for a crematorium for the district, which will look to offer a compassionate and quality service at reasonable prices. And of course, protecting the nationally important biodiversity on that site whilst giving the widest possible public access. We also look forward to reviewing proposals for the £2 million Growth and Infrastructure Fund we've launched to support communities across the district with delivering their capital projects. That could be improvements to village halls, open spaces, recreation and sports facilities, spaces for nature, support for the environment, almost anything really that supports growth in the district. The application process is now open uh, and applications need to be in by five o'clock on Friday the 7th of October, so I encourage all of you to promote this uh, across the district. Uh, details in the application form are available on the grants page of the Council's website. And I work with the Combined Authority on Skills and Education and the, the support of uh, our representative, Councillor Liz Every, uh, will continue where the focus is on the Skills Employment Hub and, and Adult Education. I continue to be proud of the record of delivery of this council and I, I thank the council for its approach 
and commitment to getting things done. And I ask all councillors to recognise the objectives of the corporate plan by voting for it this evening. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Do I have any speakers <laughs> to the corporate plan? No. Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chairman. I need to start with the usual health warning that this document is basically a work of fiction. This administration deliberately and willfully removed from a previous version of this document all reference to its flagship project to replace Meeple Outdoor Centre with an unwanted £7 million crematorium. It hid that scheme from residents for 18 months while spending public money on it, until it was forced to admit its plans to the public after secret papers were leaked to the press. So we can have no confidence at all that the administration's real plans are in this document, and it's therefore to all intents and purposes worthless. The first bullet point in the first row of the first column, keep delivering great services, will give rise to hollow laughter from residents who have seen this administration preside over a shambolic change to the most basic service of all, the bin collection. It was only when the administration adopted almost in their entirety the proposals laid out by my colleague, Councillor Mark Inskip, that the service began to move towards some level of reliability. And four months on, it's still not there yet. The administration's transport policy is incoherent and self-contradictory. It wants to attract thousands more cars onto a dual day 10 from Ely to the Cambridge border while opposing any steps to resolve the existing and worsening traffic congestion in the city. Congestion, by the way, in which any additional bus provision would also be caught up. At least this administration now says it wants to put right the appalling mess it made at the A10A142 BP roundabout. The installation at this key junction for which they were the cheerleaders used public money to pay for a planning obligation on Grosvenor to build a scheme which completely failed government guidance on active travel, leaving walkers and cyclists stranded. On this side of the chamber, we recognised this disaster for what it was from the outset, and we have been lobbying hard for this administration's mess to be cleaned up. But our fear now is that the same mistake will be repeated at the other A10 BP roundabout at Littleport. We have been presented by this administration with a sketch which shows a new cycle route from Littleport Station to the eastern edge of the roundabout, with no apparent place for cyclists to go safety, safely from there uh, or anywhere to reach the growing industrial units on the western side. I've already raised a red flag with the Highways Authority on this to warn early that cyclists must not be dumped on the edge of a busy roundabout and that safe crossing must be integral to the design of this scheme. This administration continues to pursue its divisive approach to community land trusts and its obsession with 100k homes, which risk trapping people in accommodation that no longer meets their needs, but from which they cannot afford to move on. Meanwhile, the real need in Cambridgeshire is for homes for social rent, which are not mentioned at all in the housing part of this plan. Perhaps the administration has a secret scheme for those two, which it's hiding from us. At the MOD site in Ely, it's now three years since we on this side demanded that the administration achieve significantly more than the 30% affordable homes required in the increasingly outdated local plan. We will continue to hold the administration to account to deliver this. Not everything in this plan is inadequate or ill-considered, but enough of it is to prevent us from supporting it this evening. Thank you, Councillor Dupre. I've got Councillor Every next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be supporting these recommendations. I am particularly supportive of the enhanced input into economic development in the area. With increased staffing, the economic development team has been working on allocations of funds to our businesses, providing business advice and also working with our business organisations to promote other opportunities for funding to support sustainability and growth. And are currently have been involved very heavily in a large bid for, for levelling up. Um, we are also actively working with stakeholders on our place-based skills strategy for the district, which is based on an extensive survey of need and have received funding from the combined authority to coordinate a new business and employability hub 
located in the Leely Library, pulling together all the partners involved in education, training, qualifications and recruitment to be the place to go to for residents, young people, businesses and those interested in improving their qualifications which we hope to roll out to other parts of East Cambridgeshire, particularly Soham and Littleport. A recent result from regular collaboration with the Combined Authority Skills Department is a feasibility study on a further education presence in East Cambridgeshire. I am delighted that we continue and increase our support for our local businesses and business leaders, which is vital to the growth of the economy in the district. Increasing the out employment in opportunities, including apprenticeships, for our young people in sector employees and support our ambition for more businesses to start up or relocate to our area. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, thank you, Councillor Every. I've got Councillor Hunt now. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I, I'm really quite amazed at this, um, this sheet. It's just full of ambition and achievement, and I'm really proud to be associated with it. I don't think I really need to go into every detail here, but I, I made, when I first read it, I made a few uh, notes and they were, but this is positive, far ranging and ambitious, and a credit to the administration. And I think it's more than a credit to the administration, it's a credit to the officers who support the administration as well. And I, I, I I find it very hard to believe that the party over there can be faced with this list of, of homes. Chair, point of order. Point yes, Councillor Dupre. Could I ask the Chief Executive to confirm that officers of this authority support all members, regardless of their political affiliation? I'm very happy to confirm that, Chair. Councillor Hunt. Okay, so. I'm very proud of what is suggested, tasked and achieved. And, I, and I'm particularly, I have a concern uh, about the cleaner, greener East Cambridgeshire. Um, I think it's absolutely the right of the opposition to hold the administration to account. But I must say I've been particularly worried and almost felt like I was uh, being a victim of a stalker when I find out that the opposition have had councillors going around my house, photographing my wheelie bins at the end of my drive and using them for political purposes. And if, if, if the opposition would like to say that it's coincidental out of the 10 houses in Ely that they got mine and it's totally coincidental, I would find that unbelievable. But I would like to just say to Councillor Inskip, if he wants to come to my house and photograph my private dwelling, then maybe he should ask me before he does it. And I think it's really quite unnerving to see opposition councillors lurking out with your dustbins, waiting for there to be an opportunity for there to be two bins out there and, and to come back and take these photographs and submit them to the local paper. That apart, uh, I, I really believe that this is an excellent document. I'll be proud to support it. And I, I, I just highlighted one other item here, and, and, and it just goes, uh, deliver a crematorium. And, and of course, I was reminding myself that the Wildlife Trust for Beds, Cams and North Hants has got the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats as one of their directors, and we did take advice from them. So they may like to organise their own group opinions. Thank you, Chair, and I will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Hunter. I'm seeing no more speakers, in which case I'll go to Councillor Josh Schumann as the seconder of the motion. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to start by congratulating Councillor Dupre um, because she's managed to do what I thought was almost impossible which is uh, I'm somebody who loves this time of year and the sunshine, the warm weather, and it often puts a smile on my face. And yet the diatribe I just heard, I nearly forgot that we're in the middle of summer and we should be enjoying things and trying to look at positives instead of what was quite frankly, the most miserable speech I think I've ever heard in this chamber. Um, much like our annual budget, 
the opposition have the opportunity to propose an alternative corporate plan, come up with alternative ideas, bring recommendations forward. And instead, we heard five minutes of moaning and groaning about what we're achieving and the work that we're doing without any credible alternative. What a shame, and I'm really saddened that the people of East Cambridge are represented by people that don't wish to bring ideas, but simply chuck mud. I don't want to talk any further than what the Councillor Bailey, our leader, has talked to this corporate plan because it speaks for itself. Far from work of fiction, this corporate plan sets out priorities, clearly makes pledges and shows how we've delivered against them. I don't think there's many authorities with such transparency and certainly not when I look at neighbouring authorities of South Cambridge here. I find it laughable that Councillor Dupre criticises our brilliant waste service. Yes, they've had challenges, but calling it simple and basic, and I quote those words from Councillor Dupre, is far from the truth of the brilliant work that I think our waste services do day in, day out, in quite frankly at the minute, really difficult circumstances. Not to mention that some of those challenges have been brought around by changing routes, which is an environmental benefits and uh, more sensible routing, which haven't been done for, for a, a, a period of time and was long overdue. So the corporate plan, as I said, Chairman, speaks for itself. I think it's ambitious, it's bold, it's positive. Such a shame the opposition party have none of those qualities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Schumann. I, I go to Councillor Bailey to sum up. Yeah, thank you. I do need to address some of the things that have been said, Chairman. Thank you. Um, there, there was reference to the fact, again, that we removed reference to the crematorium in the corporate plan, and I'd just remind everybody that that was under the advice of officers and sector experts. Uh, it, it wasn't done in secret. It was confidential. Uh, the policy was worked up confidentially, and there is a, an absolute difference, and I'm certain that there are policies being worked up at uh, neighbouring authorities run by uh, Liberal Democrat uh, party uh, where you know confidential matters need to be dealt with behind closed doors uh, and of course councils are able to to work up policy uh, before uh, putting it forward to, to full council and, and the public uh, yes there has been uh, frankly what I think is the first glitch in services in my living memory at this council uh, with the waste service I'm not blind to that I've been absolutely open about it it isn't good enough uh, there are extenuating reasons for it. We're not the only local authority to be suffering problems and disruptions to waste collection services. It's happening all over the country. It's happening in South Cambridgeshire District Council and Cambridge City Council. Uh, and uh, recruiting HGV drivers is a national problem. We've had high levels of sickness. Uh, you know, it's something that we need to deal with and we are taking significant steps to deal with that. That doesn't mean that all the services at East Cam's District Council are terrible. The services at East Camps District Council are high performing services of which I continue to be incredibly proud and we will get the waste service back to, to where it should be and we're working every single day to make that happen. And I think to, to try and pretend that that's somehow, you know, devastating because it's one service that has, has had some, some issues uh, from some factors that are completely outside of its control is, is not... Uh, helpful to the staff working in this authority uh, and I think it's it's really sad to hold it up as an example and I think services overall are very good quality at this council and I'm proud of that and I'm proud of the fact that we've delivered a council tax uh, freeze for nine years in a row whilst running great services and we've had this minor glitch for a period of two 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 and a half months which we will get over. Uh, we are certainly not opposing steps to deal with congestion uh, in Cambridge City. We're opposing congestion charging because it's a uh, regressive tax on the least well off, uh, those who can least afford it, those people that rely on um, their, their cars to get to uh, work and care services and, and health services in Cambridge and, and support the economy of Cambridge and keep it functioning, frankly. Um, what we are doing and, and recognising is that it's much better to deliver improvements with a carrot, not by using a stick. And, and I've uh, been very vocal for a very long time about how what we're doing is to try to support bus service improvements and active travel improvements to uh, lure people out, out of their cars and rail improvements. Um, the the um, improvement at the BP roundabout, uh, Councillor Dupre, I, I, I has has got it wrong. I've said this before. Uh, there was no failure to adhere to government guidance with the BP roundabout upgrade. LTN 120 did not exist 
at the time the BP roundabout upgrade was completed. It was not in existence. There was no failure. I have always, and this council has always recognised that there needs to be a safe crossing for pedestrians and cyclists somewhere near in the vicinity of the BP roundabout. And it was a firm commitment of the previous mayor. And I do, do believe if the previous mayor was still around, he would be getting on with it. Unlike the current mayor, who seems to be fiddling around saying he supports it, but doing absolutely nothing to deliver it. We've always been pushing, we've always been committed uh, to the delivery of that very necessary crossing to, to join up um, the, the uh, what I now understand is a substandard cycle, cycle uh, path next to the A142. And that doesn't meet a LTN 120 either, which causes problem with problems with joining up Haddenham to it because you're not allowed to do that. So, so despite the best efforts of the county council, you know, we, things are still, it, it's not easy to deliver these things in, a, in, a, in our rural area. Um, I, I don't support the claim that uh, we are taking a divisive approach to community land trusts. Uh, and I quote again that the case of Kennet, where more than half of the adult population are members of the uh, of the CLT of the trust, uh, and they voted in an independently verified referendum to support the planning application and take it forward. It was properly democratically done. Uh, 100k homes. Uh, <laughs> how you can have a go at 100k homes? Uh, people people who live in 100k homes have the, benefit, now, have the benefit of. Uh, low cost mortgages, which mean that they can save towards their next property. And on the MOD, we've always made the commitment you cannot deliver additionality in the affordable home 30% level until after you've secured planning permission. That is perfectly clear. I don't know how many more times I need to say it. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't recognise the, the points that Councillor Dupre is making at all. OK, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Um, that ends the debate on this, so we're going to the vote and the recommendations are members are requested to small one approve the updated corporate plan set out in Appendix 1, small two note the completed actions and progress made during the past 12 months and small three instruct the monitoring officer to amend the constitution to make necessary amendments to reflect the new corporate plan. So can I ask all of those who are in favour of those recommendations? And all of those who are against. Any abstentions? No. Thank you. So the recommendations are carried by 14 votes to five. Okay, thank you, Tracy. I move now on to item 10, which is a schedule of items recommended from committees and other member bodies. And we've got one item before us tonight in respect of the recommendation from the Finance and Assets Committee in re relation to the Treasury Operations Annual Performance Review. Do I have a proposer for that recommendation? Thank you, Chairman. Happy to propose Absolutely. that the contents of the report on the Council's Treasury Operations, including the Prudential and Treasury Indicators as set out in the appendix, be approved. And in proposing that, I'd like to record mine and the committee's thanks to the finance team and, their, and congratulations to them for another solid performance in Treasury management. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Do, do I have a seconder for that one? I have to second that, Chair. Do I have any speakers on the Councillor Harris? During the uh, committee meeting, I noted that uh, section six in the Treasury report, which was the overall projection of economic performance going forward for this country, appeared to be using out of date figures and appeared to be extremely over optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm very just a little surprised that nobody has gone back to it and asked the question, should we put a little dose of realism on this? Uh, because the economic situation is continuing to deteriorate and probably will do so uh, over the rest of this year. So I'm not sure that we can altogether trust the assumptions made here. And 
I say this having gone on record every time I've seen a Treasury report and saying I think it's exceptionally well written, very professionally prepared, um, good people have been working on it. I still believe that, but I think they needed to go back and run the figures again. If things turn out as some of us feel they will, and that would explain why we're not inclined to say much about your corporate plan, because it will torpedo it. So that's just an observation. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Howe. Is, is it, Ian, is there anything you wish to comment on at this stage or not? I, th I think I said in the <coughs> meeting, the Finance Access Committee meeting, that the narrative in this report is the narrative which was in place at the 31st of March when the report is, you know, when the figures are from, and when further Treasury management reports are produced during the course of the year, they will obviously have further information in them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ian. I'm seeing no other speakers. So, Councillor Bovenden, did you want to say anything? Or I'm happy to support the comments of uh, my cap co fellow councillor David Brown. And you just wish to make no further comments, Councillor Brown, or and to say, as Ian said, this this is the review looking backwards. That's the why it was written the way it is. Future reports will, I'm sure, reflect what Councillor Harris was saying. Okay, thank you, Councillor Brown. In which case, I then move to the recommendation that um, we resolve that the contents of the report on the Council's op Treasury operations during 2021, including the prudential and Treasury indicators as set out in Appendix 1 to the submitted report, be approved. All those in favour of that? I, th I think that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, members. I now move on to item 11, which is the community governance review. And I've got, um, I understand I've got Adrian introducing the paper. Uh, thank you, Chairman. This report is in reference to a community governance review prompted by an application from Wesley Waterless Parish Meeting, a copy of which is at Appendix 1, relating to a suggestion to change the parish boundary between Borough Green and Wesley Waterless. So in accordance with the provisions within the Local Government and Public Involvement in Health Act 2007, this council was obliged to undertake a review. The review will be completed in two stages, each with a consultation period followed by a report to this council. The stage one consultation has been completed and involved consulting a wide range of stakeholders as shown in appendix three where the terms of reference for the review to, together with a map showing the proposed boundary changes were provided. As you can see from the map on page 13, the existing boundary only includes some of the dwellings on the north side of Main Street, but not others. The proposal aimed to bring all of those dwellings within the Wesley Waterless Parish. This is what the consultation proposed, and as shown in paragraph 3.4 of the report, the responses demonstrate no objections to those proposed changes. Therefore, I'm happy to recommend that we go to stage two of the consultation progress based on those proposed boundary changes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, from the Chair, am going to propose the recommendations. Just to add a bit of context, Borough Green is in my district ward, and some of the county, some of the parish boundaries, sorry, are absolutely bizarre. You've got houses, you go from house A, which is in Borough Green, to house, house B, which is in Wesley Waterless, and then to house C, which is in Borough Green. They're based on the old, very old parish boundaries. And, and Wesley, both of those villages are in my county division. So the, the actual boundaries are, are in, totally need. And I certainly would um, be happy to propose from the chair that we go ahead with the consultation. Um, and if Councillor Trapp and Kane have been here, I'm sure they would have agreed with it because they'll be aware of this um, absurd nature of the boundaries. And I believe... Yep, happy to second, Chairman. Do I have any comments or... or did, um, <clears throat> no, so I, I'm assuming that uh, members agree that um, totally. Great, thank you. 
Thank you very much, members. We move on to the last item, which is you will have had sent to you, um, and it, you, you've got the paper version on the table in respect of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority Update Report. Um, looking at the um, what we've got before us, the Audit and Governance Committee is still to come. So I would, I will that that will obviously come back to have to come back to the next meeting of council in case there are any questions on that meeting that they held on the 30th of June. So in respect of the other meetings of the combined authority, are there any questions of members of that of those committees? I'm seeing nothing in which case um, that is the end of the meeting. And I'd like to thank um, members of the public and the press who are watching online for their attendance and many apologies for the late start, which was to say it earlier was due to a a technical problem we had with the live stream. Thank you, members, and a safe journey home.